I call this one the New England Colonies. So turn the page over. I know you didn't quite fill it all up. Turn the page over. We're going to start a brand new page and a brand new lesson. This is lesson number seven. Now, this is the one you previewed and looked at for your homework assignment. So you should know a little bit about that. And what I'm hoping is, is that that you'll be seeing this and doing the homework assignment and you'll be kind of looking at this and you're going, oh, I have a question. Oh, and you'll ask an intelligent question in Mr. Cat's class that will get some intelligent discussion going on. So you got that? Did you write down number seven right there? Did you make the heading just a little bit larger than the rest of it? Just This particular lesson, I call this one the New England Colonies. Now notice it says New England Colonies. We know what a colony is. That's where people come and they, they settle in an area for the first time. That's a colony. We know what England means. What's New England? What's that for you? What does New England mean? New England is actually the name that was given to this area right here. And it was named by this guy right here. Write down this question. How did New England get its name? This is the area of New England. You can see the map right there. It goes from... Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. That's the area today in the United States that we call New England. And the reason why we call it New England is because what John Smith did. Now, John Smith was the savior of the colony of Jamestown. Well, how did he get up to New England? Well, he actually took a boat. He traveled up to New England, and then he went back to England. And he named this region right here. Now, I actually have it right there. Let me highlight it for you. Captain John Smith explored the north coast of this region and named it New England. And when he got back to England, he pointed on a map what it is. And he kind of drew things out. And he says, this area right here is New England. Now, all of the European countries call it after their own country. New England means that this is the New England. Old England's across the pond. And New England's right here. New Spain. Old Spain is across the pond, and New Spain is down here in Mexico. New France, New Amsterdam, New Netherlands, they all name it the new. The new part is, this is the new country. This is our new colonies, and each country is going to have that. Okay, so who were these first people that's come to the new world? And these people that first come to the new world are what I'm going to call the pilgrims. Now, the pilgrims were also known as separatists. Well, because... You have to kind of study the history of the pilgrims a little bit. And if you Google pilgrims and get like a, like a Wikipedia of the pilgrims, it's going to tell you a lot of information. Wikipedia is a pretty good source for just getting a real good synopsis of what happened during that time. But the pilgrims were a group of separatists that lived in a town called Scrooby, Scrooby, England. And Scrooby, England was this congregation that was led by John Robinson. And part of your homework assignment was to mouse over this area right here and find out some things about Scrooby, England, about where it was on the map and stuff like that. Well, John Robinson was the pastor of this congregation, and they didn't like being persecuted in England. Now, they were separatists for a reason, because they didn't like the Anglican Church. They thought the Anglican Church was too much of a Pope Church. The Pope was control. The Pope had the purse strings of the church. And so they wanted to flee. And you know where they went to? Holland. They went to Leiden, Holland, right here. And they lived in Leiden, Holland, for a long time, but they didn't quite really like being living in Leiden. Well, first of all, they weren't Dutch, they were English. They liked their English heritage. They didn't really like becoming Dutch. And so they sought to leave Holland. They sought to leave the Netherlands for a particular reason. And there, I've got three reasons right here why they left the Netherlands. Number one reason is because their children were forced to work long hours. Now remember, back then, children worked. None of you would be going to school right now. You know what you'd be doing? Working. And you would have worked for the last 10 years of your life. I know you're only 16 and 17, but you would have started working at age six. You probably would have worked in a factory or a field, planting crops, pulling weeds or something. It's no fun. Trust me on this. You'd rather be in school. I know you don't like school. I know. I know you think, oh, I'm going to school. But trust me, you don't want to be working 17th century Holland as a child laborer. And then they were also concerned for their children's spiritual health. You see, the Dutch were known as being a little bit risque. They were a little bit being out there. And they weren't as spiritually in tune as perhaps maybe they were back in England. The Scrooby congregation, well, they were pretty self-righteous. They were pretty righteous in what they believed. And then plus... Their children were starting to speak Dutch. Now, that's not so bad, but think of it like this. They really liked their English heritage. They really liked the fact that they were Englanders. They didn't like the fact that they were starting to speak Dutch and act Dutch and act in the sinful ways of the Dutch. And so they said, how can we get out of here? There was a guy by the name of Sir Edwin Sandys. Sir Edwin Sandys contacted John Robinson and said, Hey, why don't you take your congregation and go to the New World? The New World? Tell me more about this. Oh, yeah, there's this place. And Captain John Smith wrote about it. It was called New England. And you could go right there and you could settle. In fact, if you went down to Virginia, you could mix in with the people at, at Jamestown. So he starts to think about this. Huh, 
well, we could do this. We could leave Holland and we could go to the New World. He asked members of the congregation, how many of you want to leave? And they all wanted to go. There was about, oh, 150 that wanted to go. So they got in the boat and they left Holland and they went to Plymouth. They went to Plymouth. And when they were at Plymouth, they got two boats. They got all their money together, all their supplies. They got two boats, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. And they took off. And just as they left the coast of Plymouth right there and they went off and they could just see Ireland right there, all of a sudden the Speedwell springs a leak and they limp back to port. So the speedwells, they can't take it. What should we do? Well, you 50 go on the Mayflower and go across. They said, no, 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 no. We're all going. All or none. And so guess what? They all got on this little bitty boat. I mean, this boat was no long bigger than this room. I'm not kidding. You think I'm kidding. In fact, it was skinnier than this, than this room right here. It was about as long. Okay, it's about as long. And it had a lower deck and an upper deck. That was it. 101 people on the boat. How many people are in this classroom? Let's just say 25. Take that times four. Upper deck, lower deck. And I don't know if you know this, but these people weren't sailors. These people were farmers and factory workers. And I don't know if you know what happens on a boat on the ocean, but it goes up and down and up all day long. And your stomach doesn't know which way is up. And if your stomach doesn't know which way is up, your equilibrium starts to turn. You get what they call seasickness and you vomit everything out of your stomach. <laughs> For days on end, you can't eat and you get sick. I mean, your face literally turns green. But they made it. They did make it across. They didn't all make it. A couple of them died on the ship, but they make it across. They land at a place that they're going to call Plymouth. They land a little too far north. They were actually trying to get to Virginia to be in that London company contract that they had. And they landed a little bit too far north. But they decided, you know, let's just stay here. I know we're too far north. I know that we're supposed to be in Virginia right now. It's further south. And they landed at this place called New England. And this is where they're going to set up their first settlement in the New World. And so here's the pilgrims. Now, these people were Bible-toting, tongue-talking, church-going folk. I mean, they were. this was the, This would be like victory saying, let's go live in Bolivia. I mean, so think about this. Pastor Sharon says, you know, who wants to go with me? Where I'm taking my congregation. We're going to Bolivia. Who would go? Well, okay, we wouldn't go, but if you were as desperate as they were, they all went. They heard about the new world and the dreams that they could have. But remember, when they land at Plymouth Rock, there's nothing there. They don't go check into the local Holiday Inn. There's no quick trip to go get their drink and their slushy. They can't do that. There's nothing. And besides the fact, how are they going to be governed? Because they're too far north. And so now they have to come up with some kind of agreement to be governed. And that's what this Mayflower Compact is. Write that one down. The Mayflower Compact compact set this important precedent or example of representative government. And here's a picture of it right here. This is actually what it looked like. And if you can kind of read it right there, it says, in the name of God, amen. So, I mean, you could tell their Christian awareness right here is that they are doing this, you know, with God's blessing. We whose names are underwritten, loyal subjects of our dreaded Sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, of France, of Ireland, King, and so forth, of full of faith. And says, we whose names are written, we want to be governed. We establish this government. And this is what it does. The Mayflower Compact was a piece of paper that established a written type of government or, or people that would govern them outside of Virginia, outside of that London company that they were. And then, of course, you know, there's some very, very famous people who have signed this Mayflower Compact, and then it wasn't your homework assignment, wasn't this part of your assignment to, uh, to uh, find out some of these names right here, and then some of the more famous people that have signed this throughout history, you know, some of their relatives have, you know, been on famous ex exploration missions and things like that. Uh, some of these people, most people consider more, some of the more intelligent, some of the, the more brave, some even consider some of these people to be uh, handsome in some ways, and then their descendants have come, well, to become great teachers. And did you have a question? Um, how's your name in there? I'm sorry, where are you, where are you pointing to? Is it the name somewhere? I, I actually have one of my relatives who uh, underwritten here. So you, as far as records go, I, I think it's, it's difficult to take temperature records, you know, of what the temperature is and stuff like that and how much snowfall you get. But from their writings, this was a very difficult winter. It was an extremely heavy snowfall, a bitterly cold winter. Maybe it's just because they're not used to, it gets cold, free, things freeze, and people die. Half of the people died that first winter. See if you got on Ten years after Ralph arrives in Jamestown, another group of English settlers lands in North America. They come ashore on a deserted beach 450 miles up the coast from Jamestown and call the place Plymouth after the English port they sailed from. 
These are a different breed of settler, a group of religious dissidents with faith at the center of their lives. They made the dangerous Atlantic crossing seeking religious freedom in the new world. 24-year-old apprentice printer Edward Winslow arrives with a group of religious sectarians on a boat called the Mayflower. By April 1621, their settlement is taking shape. The Mayflower returns to England. The pilgrims are on their own in an unknown land. A great hope and inward zeal we had of laying some great foundation for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. There are 19 families, goats, chickens, pigs, and dogs. They have spinning wheels, chairs, books, guns, and no way home. If you create this environment as a land of opportunity, then you're gonna attract those type of people who wanna take that risk, who have, wanna take that, uh, uh, that gamble, and who believe in a, in a better life. They were heading for the Hudson River, but they've landed 200 miles further north at the beginning of winter. They have arrived in the middle of a mini ice age, temperatures two degrees colder than today. Winters are longer, growing seasons shorter. The soil is poor, little grows, food supplies run low. In the first three months, more than half the pilgrims die. William Bradford is the governor of a community soon in desperate trouble. It pleased God to visit us with death daily. Disease was everywhere. The living were scarcely able to bury the dead. They died sometimes two or three a day of 100 and odd persons. Scarce 50 remained. At times, only six are fit enough to continue building their shelters. Susanna White's husband dies that first winter. Edward Winslow's wife perishes a month after. Within weeks, White and Winslow marry. They'll have five children. Today, more than 10% of all Americans can trace their ancestry back to the Mayflower. For a time, Plymouth provides the sanctuary they sought. But like Jamestown, there were others here first. April, 1621. The pilgrims have been in the New World for five months. Barely half survived the first winter. But they're not the first Europeans to arrive on this coast. Five years before, European ships brought light-skinned people and plague. Almost nine out of 10 of the local people are wiped out. The Poconoke people don't need enemies. They make peace with the pilgrims. They teach the English how to grow crops in sandy soil using fish for fertilizer. But they want something in return. 
They have a common enemy, a rival tribe, and the English have powerful weapons. The pilgrims aren't soldiers, but in the new world, they have to fight to survive. On August 14, 1621, pilgrims and Poconokit, shoulder to shoulder, will launch a surprise attack that will seal their future in this new land. It was resolved to send 14 men, well armed, and to fall upon them in the night. The captain gave charge, let none pass out. rival tribe doesn't know what hit them. Surrounded, they have no answer for English firepower. Poconokit and pilgrims find common ground and a chance to survive. Two unlikely allies, a partnership all too rare in North America. We have found the Indians very faithful in their covenant of peace with us. They are people without any religion or knowledge of any god, yet very trusty, quick of apprehension, right-witted, and just. Their victory brings a period of peace to the colony. Their friendship is celebrated in a feast. In time, it will become known as Thanksgiving. One of the main themes in the founding of America was a place to do business, a place to expand your horizons, a place to live a life of your own, practice your own religion. Those are the basic themes that brought people to these shores to colonize. It's the start of a period of prosperity it will transform you know, the America. Walt Disney movie about Squanto. You know how Squanto was taken as an Indian, you know, from, from Massachusetts and then taken back to England. He wrestles a bear and lives with the monks for a while and then makes it back on a boat back to America and then helps solve the squabble between the pilgrims and the Indians. I don't know that that happened. I know that there was an Indian named Squanto. He did speak into English a little bit and he did help a little bit, but the writing of the Walt Disney history of Squanto, I don't know that all that happened. So, but Squanto did help these first Pilgrim Fathers. And whether or not it was that first winter or the second winter, some historians believe it was the third winter that they celebrate this first harvest day. And Squanto was part of that. So I'm not exactly sure when this was, but he was part of that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the Pilgrim Forefathers. John Carver was the first governor of the Pilgrims. William Bradford was the second governor. And look at this. And he wrote this first book. This is the first book written in America, The History of Plymouth Plantation. Now, he didn't write it the first year, but as he lived there, 30 years later, he wrote the first book. In one of my history classes that I took in college, I had to read parts of this. It was difficult to read. It was difficult to get through the these and thous and the, the way they talked back then to get what the teacher's message was that I was supposed to get out of the book. It was difficult to read. But he did say several things. He did give us a history of the pilgrims. One of the people that came on the boat, too, was Miles Standish. Now, he was the leader of the pilgrims' military defense, and he fell in love with a woman by the name of Priscilla Alden, and he began to write her letters. And these romantic letters, well, they didn't become published, but they became well-known. And a poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, years later, wrote a poem about the courtship of Miles Standish. You should Google it. You should Google the courtship of Miles Standish. It's a romantic poem written, you know, 200 years ago, but... You would like it. It's 
rather romantic. And I know sophomores don't, rom romance is kind of over the top of your head right now. You don't understand. I mean, you don't know how boys and girls, how, I mean, some of it, you know, is the pilgrims believed that they had from God several things. And one of the things that they had right here was this errand in the wilderness. Now, I'm going to explain really three things to you. Wilderness Zion, errand in the wilderness, and city upon a hill. So there's three terms that you're going to see again. A couple of them are on your pop quiz that you're going to take tomorrow. The uh, Puritans believed that they had from God an errand in the wilderness. Would somebody please take this piece of paper to the office? And you go to the office. You carrying this piece of paper. Guess what you're doing for Mr. Cap? You are running an errand. Same word. An errand was an errand from God in the wilderness. So they were in the wilderness and they were so spiritually in tune with God that they thought that this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to run this errand for God. We're supposed to be the city upon a hill. Now, city upon a hill, like, have you ever heard the proverb? Have you ever heard the proverb? You have a candle, a light. Don't put the light underneath a basket because nobody can enjoy the light. But if you take the light out of the basket and you put it up on top of candles, everybody in the room can enjoy the light. Same thing with your spiritual Christian walk. Don't put your spiritual Christian walk in a monastery somewhere. Don't put it in a classroom and never let it out. But let your light shine. I mean, you sang that song as a four-year-old in children's church. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's the same type of thing. Put it, put a city upon a hill. You are an example to other people. And then a third thing right here is that the Puritans also believe that they were hardworking and that self-government is going to help make Plymouth successful. Now, there's two P words that I want to teach you. Pilgrims. And Puritans, they're not the same people. Pilgrims were the 100 that come over on the boat. Which boat? The Mayflower. And then the Puritans were the 50,000 other people that come over on hundreds of boats. Okay, so the Puritans, yes, they were of like-minded, like spiritual faith with the Pilgrims. They were separatists and congregationalists from England. And they came over f in search of a better life. But the pilgrims were the first Mayflower folk, and the Puritans were the thousands of others that come over in hundreds of other boats that come over. And they settled in a place that I'm going to call right here Massachusetts Bay. Now, I've got it in yellow for a reason. Remember, they got off the boat at Plymouth, but that's not the name of the colony. The colony is not named Plymouth Colony. I mean, for the pilgrims it was, but when the Puritans all come over and thousands of people, it becomes known as Massachusetts Bay Colony. That's what Massachusetts first became known as. Virginia was a colony. Virginia Colony. Massachusetts Bay was a colony. New York was a colony. New Jersey was a colony. Georgia was a colony. So all of those were colonies, and Massachusetts Bay was a colony. Plymouth was never a colony. It was a settlement that turns into Massachusetts Bay. In 1630, there was this impressive fleet of 17 ships and over 100 settlers that come to Massachusetts Bay. How would you like to have been, you know, the food vendor outside the harbor when all these folks are coming off the boat? Yeah, get your corn dog right here, slushy, you know, free drink, you know. I'd just like to be the quick trip owner there. Fill your car up with gas as you go out to the highway. Yeah, here we go. When you get a thousand people coming off the boat at the same day, that's a lot. Jonathan Winthrop, he was the Puritan governor who dreamed of this wilderness Zion. Now, after wilderness Zion, can you just put a little arrow? You put right here, city of God. That's what Zion means. The city of God is Zion. You know, blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. You know, Zion is the city of God. And the city of God is also part of this errand in the wilderness, city upon a hill, the spiritual belief that we are doing something great for God here in Massachusetts. Now, there were several important Puritan political principles. And the reason why we talk about these today is because these important Puritan political principles were also precedents. That's a lot of Ps. A precedent is something, is an example that you follow in the future. So every time they do something, they pass a law, they make an ordinance, they do something for their community, all the rest of the world is going to see this because they're going to write about it. They're going to be the city upon a hill. And they believed in three important political principles. The first one that they believed in is that the government should be limited in what they should be able to do. Like they believed that every citizen should be able to have a gun and go and shoot a deer if they want to. Use it for their self-defense. The right to keep and bear arms, if I could call it that. And they didn't think that the government should be able to take that right away. So the government is limited because they can't take away the right to have a gun. So that's cool. We do want our government limited. And we talk about these three important Puritan political principles because we still have these today. And these are cherished among people today. The second principle that they believed in was the fact that citizens 
should be able to participate in government by choosing their leaders, by running for office themselves, by carrying a sign if they need to, by going and talking to their leaders about what laws they think should be passed. Citizens should be able to participate. And then finally, the government should be able to protect private property. Now, I know right now that their government is still doing that today. If somebody breaks into my house and tries to steal my big screen TV, you know what I do? No, I make one phone call, 911. And they come on out and they protect my private property. Yeah, he's running down the street. Go get him. And they bring it back. And that's the Puritan political principle that we still enjoy today. This is so important for American citizens is private property. And the God, the God of Israel is among us. He shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. Ten years after the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth, a group of Puritan merchants and gentlemen obtained a royal charter for the Massachusetts Bay Company that authorized them to colonize and conduct trade in New England. The end is to improve our lives, to do more service to the Lord. We must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Puritans felt some type of obligation to historic Christianity, to demonstrate historic Christianity, what they thought was the pure religion. And uh, this was a matter of a covenant, but they were always woefully aware of their, their humanness, their limitations, or their sinfulness. They weren't perfectionists, but they wanted to move towards it and, uh, and demonstrate to the world uh, what uh, God can, could do through people who were deeply committed to living what they deemed to be the holy life. They were very earthy people. Uh, they knew how to have fun. These people, they struggled every day. They worked, they drank, they played. They focused on uh, holy living, but often they were uh, some, sometimes far less than that. John Wentham's vision for his society as the governor of Massachusetts Bay was an almost utopian one in the sense that he believed that Boston would be a city on a hill and that all the world would look at it. What he didn't really understand was that many Puritans came to the newer world knowing what they disliked in the old but not always understanding what they wanted in the new. And when they came to the new world they oftentimes discovered that while they had gathered together as dissenters in the old world to flee Anglican intolerance, they realized that in the new world they didn't really think exactly alike on a wide range of issues. And all of these issues brought turmoil to a colony that seemed to be a, an almost utopian It's important that we adventure. participate in government. It's important that we limit our government. Okay, and then let's just finish up this lesson. If we talk about heritage, a heritage is something that somebody left us. We talked about our Spanish legacy that's also our Spanish heritage, something that we have. Have you ever been to El Paso? Those names, those Spanish names are part of our Spanish heritage. Well, the Puritans leave us other things too. You know what? That limited government, participate in vote in government and private property, that's heritage. We have that example still today. I think it's cool that I can call the police and they come and protect my private property. But our Puritan heritage goes much deeper than that. You see, my parents weren't from the Puritans. I can't boast of anybody except that one signer of the Mayflower Compact, of anybody that really came off the boat, but I still enjoy their heritage. And I have a strong Puritan work ethic. You see, I believe that it's God's will for me to work. God's will for me to work hard. I work really hard at this. To be great, I have to do something other than that. To be great in life, you have to do something that nobody else has done. Think about that for a second. Do you want to be great? You have to do something that nobody else has done before. Abraham Lincoln, you know what he did? He wasn't really that great, except he did one thing. He freed the slaves. He said, no more slavery. No other president had ever done that. No leader had ever freed the slaves. He did it. That's what made him great. Real simple. Martin Luther King, another great man. You know what he did? He cried for freedom when nobody else would in the civil rights movement. To be great, you have to do something that nobody else has done before. Well, the Puritans were doing things that nobody else had done before. They established this hard work ethic, this Yankee ingenuity. Work hard. Be thrifty. Fix your own tools if they break. But the Puritans were also, well, they were also kind of brutal. In this Pequot War, some of the Pequot, the Indians, attacked some of the Puritans on the outskirts of the wilderness. 
killed some of them. Women, children, you know, slaughtered them. That's not cool. So in retaliation, about 50 or so Puritans went and attacked their village under the cover of darkness. And you know what they did? They shot warriors and women and children. Slaughtered them. Scalped them. They were just as brutal as the Indians were. And I like what our school theme says. Do unto others as you had them do unto you. That school theme right there, uh, that's not quite what the Puritans did. Because they didn't want that happen. Do unto others. You know, so that's... You have to kind of think about what you want to retaliate with. Thomas Hooker, he was the founder of Connecticut in 1635. Now, Thomas Hooker was a member of this uh, congregation in Massachusetts Bay. And he didn't quite agree with everything of the Puritan fathers. And they, you know, well, why don't you just take your congregation and go somewhere else? And he did. He took his congregation and they walked, you know, about 75 miles down the road. And they founded a colony called Connecticut. And then the settlement that was there was called Hartford. Now, what's the capital of Connecticut? Hartford. So he founded Hartford, Connecticut. Roger Williams was the same type of guy. He was a preacher in Massachusetts Bay. Wasn't quite getting along with the founding fathers of the Puritans. He was preaching some different stuff. And they said, you know, maybe you should take your guys and go somewhere else. And he did. And instead of going to Connecticut, he went a little bit eastward and went to Rhode Island. And he founded a settlement called Providence. Now, what's the capital of Rhode Island? Providence. You know, you see what the word means? Providence. He founded Providence as a haven of religious freedom. He said, you could come and be in Rhode Island and really believe in any Christian religion. And so that's kind of a unique distinction because if you went and settled in Massachusetts, you had to be Puritan or else you weren't going to get to vote. You weren't going to get to buy property. You weren't going to get to marry any Puritan girls. Kind of like the Amish cult. Those who deviated from the mainstream, like the minister Roger Williams, found themselves at odds with the colony's leadership. John Winthrop really looked with anticipation the arrival of uh, Williams. You know, he had a you know, tremendous reputation in England, and uh, he thought that Williams would be, uh, you know, uh, really contribute to the success of the holy experiment in Massachusetts Bay. But when Williams arrives, uh, he's critical of everything. He didn't actually think that the government should have anything to do with religion because he worried that government would corrupt religion. And therefore, he wanted a kind of hands-off policy. The trouble with that was that that opened up religion to any point of view. And in 17th century Massachusetts, that kind of toleration was not desired by John Winthrop and by others. The colony couldn't tolerate him, and they banished him to what was then Anne Hutchinson, what, write down her name. She was a woman and a member of Roger Williams' congregation, but she began to have Bible studies at her house. And the people of the founding father of the Puritans, they gave you certain things that you had to do in church services. Raise your hand, sit up, kneel down, you know, say these words during, during this church service. It's okay. But she began to say that you didn't have to do those things to get close to God. They didn't like that. They frowned upon it. And they told her to take her Bible study somewhere else. And she took it down to Rhode Island first, and then she took her and her family to New Hampshire. Write that down. So at first she was there in Massachusetts Bay, then she went to Rhode Island, and then she went to a place that they called New Hampshire. the authority of the Puritan leadership was also being challenged from a different quarter. Women in the Puritan community were basically women in a European community. The standards for women were old and traditional. But there is an extra problem in the Puritan community that they never really dealt with very well. All souls are equal, but all people are not. But the implication of the idea that all souls are equal before God means that some women, in particular, of course, Anne Hutchinson and people like that, took this logic and extended it far more than trouble for it. Anne Hutchinson was an exceptionally articulate, intelligent, and learned woman whose views about religion ran counter to those of the ministers she herself followed. She clearly believed that she could speak with God herself, and when she gathered listeners, including men, in her home on weeknights to gloss the sermons of Boston's leading ministers, Boston's clerical establishment and its political establishment couldn't tolerate such work from a 17th century woman. John Winthrop, governor of the colony and Hutchinson's nearest neighbor, filed charges against her. Anne Hutchinson, your behavior is immoral, a thing not tolerable 
nor comely in the sight of God, nor fitting for your sex. Is it not true that you have been keeping two public lectures a week in your home? It is true. Is it not true that your meetings are a promiscuous and filthy coming together of men and women without distinction or relation of marriage? I call them not, but if they come, I may instruct them. Yet you show us not a rule of God. Must I show my name written in the scriptures? They would try to reason, and that's such an aspect of, uh, of uh, you know, the Puritans, I think, that people don't appreciate. Uh, they believed in the power of reason. And so one of the ways in which they tried to enforce community standards was to reason with dissidents. And uh, that would be a, a rather elaborate process sometimes, and would take quite a while. Do you repent of your foul and damnable heresies? I know only that God can come into a person's heart. I am persuaded the revelation you bring forth is a delusion. Therefore, I do cast you out of the church. I do deliver you to Satan. And from this time forth, you are to be as a heathen and leper. After her banishment, Hutchinson eventually settled on a farm in New York where she continued to conduct discussion groups. In 1643, she and most of her family were killed by Indians. When the news reached Boston, many of her former neighbors interpreted her death as an indication of God's wrath. Winthrop even published a pamphlet in which he described her as the American Jezebel who had gotten what after spending three or four months on a small ship in the Atlantic Ocean, the settlers would see a welcome sight in the land on the horizon. But that elation was tempered by many fears, a technique the pilgrims brought with them from England. The post and beam homes in Plymouth were constructed by setting large square corner posts into the ground, upon which beams were fitted to support the roof. It was a difficult process, and much of it required the skills of a carpenter. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Um, the timbers would have had to have been squared up uh, with axes and then gathered together in a carpenter's yard. Then the carpenter would have very carefully joined those pieces together and only after his work was done would they be able to take the frame to the home site, dig the holes in the ground, and then with a lot of help, raise that frame up into place. Well, that's very interesting. So in a sense, at least a portion of the house was prefabricated. The essential elements of the frame would have had to have been cut together before the house was raised up. It's easy to see why a craftsman was necessary for the carpentry in a post and beam style home. Most early colonial post and beam houses really had no foundations as such. They were supported by posts which were set directly into the ground. As a matter of fact, in many cases the walls, such as this one right here, had direct ground contact, no separation. In fact, the wall studs themselves were often set into the ground. But this was not the case for all houses. In this home, the weight is still borne by this post, but this ground sill has been added to separate the wall from the earth and to support the end of this wall stud. So Ron, once you've got the frame up, then the next step, of course, is gonna to be to close it in. And that we do with uh, these clapboards. You know, I gotta say, I'm really surprised at the number of nails in this. I mean, I would think in the 1600s, the nails would have been hard to come by, it would expensive. Mm. They weren't so much hard to come by. There was expense to them, especially for the number you need for establishing a colony. And so, that's part of the reason for having financial backers. So the nails came with the colonists? That would have been part of the initial kit when they were coming over. Oh, that's interesting. Also, this stuff is very thin. How do they cut this? Well, this isn't so much cut. It's uh, split by a process called riving. You still do that here? We do. I'd love to see how that works. Well, let's go take a look. So, once you've taken the tree and broken it down into these smaller pieces, we uh, start with the actual work of riving. Okay. Uh, you start off with having some kind of a framework, a uh, riving break as we call it. Um, they have many different forms, but the critical part of it is these two horizontal bars. You're going to use this to trap the wood and hold it at a good working height. Um, to actually do the riving, we're going to use a, a tool called a fro. Um, and this works very, in a very similar way to a wedge. Uh, it's shaped like a wedge along the side here. 
uh, but it's used um, more of a twisting action. So to make it function, we're going to start with this club you have here, and uh, we're going to just drive this into the end grain here. And uh, what I'm going to do is get it started a little bit, and then I'm going to let you take over. So now just take the mallet and uh, keep driving that in until it's buried all the way in the wood. All the way? All the way in. I'm surprised how easily that goes yep. in. Now I'll take the mallet. And now let's pull this back and we'll lay it flat. And now just uh, twist the handle and see what happens. Push it down. Down. Yep, down. That's easy to get down. It's going fairly straight down the center. Yep, no, it's going real well. Let's just keep following that. Mm -hmm. That's coming back a little bit. Okay. Yep. Takes a certain amount of elbow grease. Oh, it sure does. You can't possibly do this and end up out of shape for very long, huh? No. Nope. Let's bring this out just a little more and see if we can finish this one off. It's starting to let go. You can feel it. There. Yeah. There we go. That it? Yep. So you can just take the throw right out and we take this out of the brake and. Very nice. Let's open that right up. The boards created by riving were perfect for use as siding, but were unusable for the roof. The first homes built in the Plymouth Colony had thatched roofs. Now I know thatched roofs have been around for a long time, but it baffles me how you can make a roof out of grass like this. Well, let me show you. We'll uh, take these bundles of grass and uh, pretend this is our roof. We've got poles nailed down under the frame of the roof, and we'll just lay these right down. Give me two more here. So we lay these down on the roof. Once we've got our course set up, we'll take a stick like this, lay it right down uh, across from where the pole is underneath, and then we can take a needle like this with a piece of cord fed through it and use this to pass the cord through the roof. Someone takes it out, I pass the needle through, they refeed it, bring it up, and then by looping the cord around here, I can tie this right down and pinch it. So it's like sewn on and stitched on in a way. Exactly. Once that's done, then hand me another bundle. Next course just goes right on top and covers over the fixings from the last one. Oh, I see. It's sort of like shingles. So the water runs down here, then onto this one, then eventually yeah, exactly. off the edge of the roof. Exactly. Oh, okay. Only difference is, of course, being grass, I can make them smooth all the way down. Now, how long would a roof like this last? Well, there's uh, roofs like this in England that have lasted for centuries. No kidding. Yeah. It's uh, just a matter when this roof starts wearing thin, you'll just add more thatch right over the top of it. And this will actually keep the water out, huh? Oh, yeah. This, if it's properly laid, can be very watertight. 